The craters and mountains of our moon bear the names of giants of science, figures like Archimedes, Kepler, and Copernicus. There is also a crater honoring someone called Jack Parsons. There are some who would rather he had been forgotten. Perhaps that's why his crater is on the dark side of the moon. Hundreds of years ago, if you told someone that one day human beings would fly through the air, they'd assume you were talking about witchcraft. And yet, in 1904, the Wright brothers flew the first successful airplane. One decade later, in 1914, Jack Parsons was born. While most boys of his generation were still fascinated by airplanes, Parsons was already two steps ahead. He dreamed about building the first rocket ship that would take men to the moon. Of course, back then this idea was considered a total fantasy. Flying an airplane is one thing, but no man could truly go to the moon. Scientists and engineers from around the world said that the math it simply didn't add up and that mankind would never make it out of the stratosphere. For Jack Parsons, the opinions of all these experts didn't stop him from trying to make this dream a reality. He studied the chemistry necessary to create a liquid rocket fuel that was in fact strong enough to defy gravity, and for good measure, he practiced a bit of magic. Yep, magic. His work would become the basis of NASA's modern day space program. This is the story of the original rocket man, Jack Parsons. The whole story is so amazing, so remarkable. Uh, and this is Los Angeles. This is Black Magic. This is the founding of NASA, of Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Jack Parsons invented solid fuel rocket engines, the same rocket engines that would later power space shuttles to the moon and help the U.S. win World War II. He was a maverick rocket scientist, okay. He was also a maverick rocket scientist spiritually. This father of American rocketry was also an occultist, devoted to a path still widely misunderstood and feared. So the founding of modern rocket science is absolutely allied and connected with black magic. Only its detractors would call it black magic. For Parsons, this was his spiritual path, as it is for its initiates today. Jack Parsons' parents, Ruth Whiteside and Marvel Parsons, were originally from wealthy families in Massachusetts. They moved to Los Angeles together in the early 1900s. In 1914, they gave birth to the subject of today's video, Marvel Whiteside Parsons. When he was very young, his parents got a divorce, and Ruth Whiteside called her son Jack instead. Ruth purchased a house on Orange Grove Avenue in Pasadena, California, which has the nickname of Millionaire Mile because the streets are lined with mansions. Jack Parsons is born in Los Angeles in 1914. His grandparents are rich, and they buy a mansion on Millionaire's Row in Pasadena. They raise him like a little prince. They give him his own laboratories. The apple of the eye of a well-off, politically connected family. Down the street, there are houses which were made to look like Algerian palaces. There are houses which uh, look like English uh, stately homes. There were all uh, manner of, of different architectures going on there. And Parsons, being a young child in the 1920s, was brought up in there. He always retained this sense of uh, fantasy, of this world of possibility that surrounded him, always remained, I think, in his mind. Infinite possibilities opened before him. Nothing seemed out of reach. Young Jack dreamed of space and rockets. He would later say it was during this time he tried to summon the devil. And that one night, the devil came. He was so fascinated by stories of magic that he once tried to summon the devil in his own bedroom. Parsons wanted to grow up to build a rocket ship so badly he was willing to do whatever it took, even selling his soul to Satan. They raise him like a little prince. They give him his own laboratories. They actually hire uh, a car to take him back and forth to high school. This, of course, gets him beat up every day in high school. Jack's an effeminate dyslexic and teased at school. Luckily, a fellow 8th grader named Ed Foreman takes pity on him and stands up for Jack. 
They talk about sending a rocket to space while disassembling fireworks, mixing the gunpowder with glue, and blowing up chunks of Jack's backyard, all before the end of their freshman year of high school. Neither Jack nor his friend Ed attend Caltech, this prestigious nearby university. So they worm their way in by making friends with students who share their belief that a rocket can go to space. He and Ed attended public lectures at local universities to learn from some of the greatest minds in the aeronautics industry. They met a Caltech student named Frank Molina, who introduced them to his thesis advisor, Theodore von Kármán. He allowed them to have access to the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory, which had been abandoned after the Great Depression. Once they had access to the state-of-the-art equipment, they gathered a team of other graduate students at Caltech to help them build a rocket engine. As their experiments got bigger and bigger, they had to move out into the desert, to an area known as the Devil's Dam in Pasadena. Rocketry at that time, it was all sci-fi, so it was imagination, fantasy. And they couldn't even call what they did rockets because rockets were something that only people who were entertainers, in other words, people who would blow up firecrackers, or people who read too much science fiction and were fantasists talked about. And so when they actually founded a group, it had to be called something else. That's why it's called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and not the Rocketry Laboratory at Caltech. They succeeded in building a rocket fuel assisted takeoff rocket called JATO. Soon enough, the United States Air Force took notice in this rocket engine. Years later, this same laboratory would become the foundation of NASA. Years later, this same laboratory would become the foundation of NASA. Administrator of NASA, Dr. T. Keith Glennon. But I should like to tick off a few items of the total mission, and among them one finds these. Expansion of human knowledge about space. Development and operation of vehicles capable of carrying instruments and man through space. The government hired Jack Parsons and his friends in order to create the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. During World War II, it was Jack and his other co-founders of the Aerojet Engineering Corporation who realized they could put rocket engines on planes, propelling the aircraft skyward. Planes could now safely take off from short runways on aircraft carriers. Parsons made so much money at all of this that he was able to buy a mansion in Pasadena, which he named The Parsonage. During the war, Jack and his colleagues are making money hand over fist, and Jack takes that wealth and bankrolls his obsession with Thelema, a new religious movement founded by the renowned English occultist Aleister Crowley. By day, Jack Parsons seemed to be a man of science and logic. Little did his friends and family know that he was leading a double life, casting magic spells at night in the hopes that the universe would help his dreams come true. He met the magician Alistair Crowley and became deeply involved with the occult. They believed in a belief system called Thelema. Their mantra was, do what thou wilt, which was a way of manifesting their wants and desires into existence. And he happens to come across this group called the Ordo Templi Orientis. Um, no, that's the, uh, the Order of the Temple of the East. This organization had come to prominence under the leadership of the British magician Alistair Crowley. Crowley was no rabbit out of the hat type of magician. He very much believed he could use magic, a kind of old time magic, to get in contact with uh, forces on a, uh, on a different metaphysical plane to the reality in which we live. He wholly rejected the teachings of the Bible and focused instead on secularism. However, anything against Christianity was interpreted as being demonic. Crowley fully embraced this as part of his identity, calling himself the Beast and attempting to summon powerful demons to come to his aid. From the time Jack Parsons was experimenting with rockets in his backyard as a kid, the idea that man could actually go into space was still a fantasy. Many people refused to believe that it could one day be real. And while it's hard for us to imagine now, the mere suggestion that man could reach the moon was considered to be rather sinful. Practitioners of Thelema did, in fact, believe in magic, but it wasn't just card tricks and parlor games. They practiced sex magic, which is exactly what it sounds like. 
They believed that the intense feeling people have while having an orgasm opens a gate to the universe. They believed that in that small window of opportunity, it is possible for a human being to perform a magic spell. Jack Parsons became the leader of his own group, and they would have huge sex magic orgies at his mansion in Pasadena. He rents numerous rooms in his 19-room mansion out to anyone as long as they don't believe in God, and conducts occult rituals involving chanting, black robes, and group sex. Eventually, L. Ron Hubbard finds himself at one of Jack's ragers, and the two become fast friends. Yes, this is the same L. Ron Hubbard who would go on to found Scientology. L. Ron and Jack spend days conducting a series of invocations that they call the Babylon Working. They follow chants and rituals created by Crowley. With L. Ron as note taker, Jack then proceeds to masturbate in front of him, all in hopes of calling forth a yet unknown woman. And that's a science fiction writer named L. Ron Hubbard. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because Hubbard would go on to found the cult of Scientology. But at this time, he was one of the very few sci-fi writers who were writing in such detail about the possibility of sending humans into space. As a hardcore sci-fi nerd, Jack Parsons was thrilled to meet L. Ron Hubbard and invited him to join in on their parties as much as he wanted. Parsons believed that he could summon a goddess named Babylon. She is described as being the great mother of the earth and a symbol of sexually liberated women. He asked his followers to participate in a project called the Babylon Working. He thought that through all of these sex magic rituals, the Scarlet Woman would come along to give birth to the moon child. They believed that this child could be raised to aspire to travel to space instead of holding on to the comforts of Earth. The Scarlet Woman was a symbol of free love throughout the world, so people could have sex outside of marriage more openly. In a way, you could actually say that this spell actually worked. Just a few years later, the United States entered the space race and the entire world turned on their televisions to watch the first steps onto the moon. In the 1960s, the hippies then spread the free love movement that Parsons had hoped for. Maybe, just maybe, all of that sex magic actually ended up working. To understand Jack's power, we need to look at other powerful people in his life, specifically a woman named Marjorie Cameron. When we talk about Parsons and we talk about the legend of Jack Parsons, there's really one woman who's central to it, and that's Cameron. Cameron shows up at a party, and Jack takes one look at her. And says, this is my witch woman. That's Babylon. That's the woman we were invoking. This is her, she's here. She just magically appeared at my house. He brought her into magic. She brought him into art. He met an actress and artist named Marjorie Cameron. Just like all of his other intentions, he had put his ideas about an elemental woman out into the universe. So when he met her, he believed that they were soulmates. Marjorie Cameron was more than a tad bit eccentric. She claimed that she had visions of the coming apocalypse and she created artwork about her occult beliefs that would later become popular during the beat generation. Jack and Cameron's hard partying lifestyle and interest in the occult became too much of a liability for his colleagues at Aerojet, so they buy him out for cheap. In 1951, Parsons' career was over and his marriage to Marjorie Cameron was falling apart, so they separated. Rudderless, Jack falls deeper into his alcoholism and drug use. Don't watch it. He takes jobs building explosives for film shoots, and it's here that we find him on that fateful day mixing chemicals in his garage for explosions that will be set off in front of movie cameras. On June 17, 1952, at 5.08 in the evening, a powerful explosion shook tranquil Pasadena, California, and so ended the life of 38-year-old Jack Parsons. His scientific legacy continues so does the puzzle of his death. Was it an accident? Uh, was it suicide? Uh, was it murder? Was it a strange occult ritual gone wrong? While others still believe that Satan himself had called Jack back to hell because of his commitment to black magic, to this day there is no proof that supports one theory over another. It's a lost history of aerospace in Southern California because so many people like Jack had to sign letters of confidentiality. 
There were layers of secrecy in this region that were like the skin on an onion. And the deeper you got, the more secret the world was. And so it's not a surprise that people with secrets of their own, like Jack, were drawn to this world. And it's not a surprise that when this world ended, no one had stories to tell about it. Families don't have stories to tell about it because when they'd ask their fathers, generally, after work, how was work, dad would say, fine. When what it really meant was, oh, we were working on weapons of mass destruction that I cannot talk to you about and that I can't talk to anyone about. We may never know the details of Jack Parsons' untimely death, but one thing's for sure, he gave us rockets and proved that the science fiction fantasy of traveling to the moon could become reality. Much like the rocket engine he helped create, his life burned hot and fast and then went out. But remnants of his brilliance and mania still power the exploration into the unknown in ways that will be felt forever. On June 17, 1952, there was a huge explosion in a house in Pasadena, California. Inside was a man named Jack Parsons. He'd lost his right arm and most of his face, but he was still conscious when help arrived. Unfortunately, a few hours later, Mr. Parsons was dead. Parsons was important because of his contributions to science, specifically rocket science. He didn't have a formal academic background, but what he did do was invent a solid rocket fuel that was the precursor to what we now use to launch objects into space. Parsons was also a member of the Suicide Squad, a group of reckless scientists who went out into the desert of California and launched rockets as fast as they possibly could go. The Suicide Squad helped found the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology. This organization partners with NASA to create Mars rovers, X-ray telescopes, and gravity mapping spaceships. However, Parsons is mainly known outside of science for being a thrill seeker, a libertine, and what some people would refer to as a wizard. Parsons was deeply interested in the occult, and he regularly performed rituals and spells with ingredients like hallucinogens and prostitutes. He followed the philosophy of Thelema, created by Aleister Crowley at the beginning of the 20th century. Crowley chose him to be the leader of his cult in Los Angeles for two reasons. One, he had lots of wealthy relationships, and two, he was very enthusiastic about sex magic. That's just the beginning of the strange stories about Parsons, but what's important is the contributions that he made to rocket science. Without Parsons, we might never have visited the moon and beyond. Without Parsons, we might never have visited the moon and beyond.